Welcome to All Set for Sunday, a podcast for busy and distracted Catholics to be a little more prepared for Sunday Mass. My name is Scott Williams. My co-host is Jeff Trailer. Hey, bud. Hey, Scott. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. Yeah? Yeah. I was trying to think of an eclipse joke. I didn't have one. Ah. Oh. Hmm. Speaking of jokesters, Father you're Myers the, on the phone. the lack of light of my life. My, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> hey, Father Meyer. How are you? You guys are looking very bright and shiny today. Ooh, is that where you're calling in from? Bright. <laughs> yeah, that, that's hilarious. No, I'm not calling in from bright. You live in bright, uh, though. I do live in bright. I watched the eclipse in bright Indiana yesterday. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. was it bright there? It was bright, and then it got dark, and then it was bright. Wow. Mm. For those of our listeners not in the path of totality, big, big eclipse day yesterday in Indiana. Yeah. And other places. A lot of fun. Boom. That was... Or Tenor, where, I said whenever you're listening, the or yeah. whenever you're listening to this, yeah, whenever you're listening, uh, I say like ten out of ten, I would watch again. Mm-hmm. That was everybody made it. There was a huge deal made about it, and then I saw it and I was like, now I get it. That was really cool. Like that was really <laughs> cool. Uh, and now I'm like, this is why a million people drove to see this. Like, yes, yeah. I get it. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty crazy. It was the yeah the whole experience. Wow. Somebody that works here goes. That good. I even took a couple of naughty looks and looked at it without my glasses on. I was like, "That's a weird way to say that." <laughs> naughty looks. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't use that. <laughs> oh. But also, don't look at the sun like that. Um, good. Well, speaking of, and they got nothing. Let's two minute drill. Yeah. Speaking of your total eclipse of the heart. Yeah. Can I just say that I listened to that song yesterday during the eclipse intentionally? You you have to. You have to. Because people across the lake from us were playing it. Yeah. It is the best song. I mean, it's just and any any listener right now who has never watched the music video, watch the music video and realize that people did a lot of drugs in the 80s. Because it is the craziest music video that has ever been made. I honestly think it's nuts. It's nuts. Right. What'd you uh, say? Or the wedding singer? Yeah. Yeah. There's a different version of that. Yeah. Not the wedding singer. Uh, so what? It... Uh, old school. No. Yeah. No. It's uh... another movie. Yeah. Anyways. Okay. Moving on. Old school. Yeah. yeah. There anyway. was an eclipse. Um, cool story. Yeah, yeah. You have to have your, you have to take a naughty look at that. <laughs> first. The lyrics on that one. Anyway. Uh, all right, third Sunday of Easter. Yep. Which, like, I got to tell you guys, just on this moment here, mm-hmm. I am nervous every week now for the podcast when I say what the week is that we're doing. Why? Because that one time I got it wrong with the Archbishop, and that. Oh yeah. And now I'm just like paranoid every time that I have mm-hmm. it wrong. But I like, I check our calendar invite and I check all the notes and I yep. and then, but every time still I say this, and I'm waiting for somebody to be like, "That's oh, all we're doing, Jeff." Jeff, this is just a great reminder that we learn from our mistakes. So you made a mistake and you've learned from it. So now you're a better podcaster because of that mistake so thank you for being being humbled oh well these are my wounds yes thank you and jesus Um, takes your wounds because he has wounds have you heard last week from father patrick hyde yes thank you that was good yeah there's some japanese art where you put gold in the cracks of the clay Ooh, yeah Yeah. i'm talking about yeah Yeah. matthew kelly wrote a whole book about that Mm mm-hmm yeah, he didn't invent that, by the way. Somebody else did. Life, yeah, yeah, yeah. Life yeah, is messy. Rediscovering gold in the cracks of the clay. Yeah, yeah. be the best version of your pottery. Yeah, <laughs> hands. Best version of your pottery. That was good. <laughs> I know that was pretty good, Matthew Kelly. You can tell him about that. Joke. Yeah, you can go ahead. And I, I will actually be talking to him tomorrow, so I will bring that up tomorrow. And then, as soon as you say say it, say get it, and then yeah. start dancing. Yeah, <laughs> I'll work on the dance. Okay. <clears throat> Give it um, my best, would you? A broken pottery dance. <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, our first reading, <laughs> do minute drill. Uh, our first reading, third Sunday of Easter, it comes from Acts chapter 3, uh, 13 to 15 and 17 to 19. So in Acts, Peter is boldly proclaiming uh, to people that it was not by his power or godliness that man was healed, but by the name of Jesus. So he's saying, like, has nothing to do with me. Jesus is doing this. He accuses the people around there of denying Jesus, the holy and righteous one, um, and calling for his crucifixion. But Peter also offers hope, which is ironic that Peter's like, hey, you all denied Jesus. Yeah. Come on, Peter. Been there, done that. Yeah. Um, 
However, Peter also offers hope and urges them to repent and turn to God so that their sins can be wiped away. Hmm. So he lets them know, hey, don't worry, just like me, you can all be forgiven. Uh, our response to our psalm this week, Lord, let your face shine on us. That is, uh, that's an, an a good psalm coming off of the eclipse. Oh, yeah. Shine, right? Like, yeah. look at that. Or. Uh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Father Meyer, we learned uh, via email what last week was not motivated uh, by a polo shirt to do the alleluia mm-hmm. as the response or preach on it. And so, sorry, Father, that you don't wear polo shirts. Um, yes. We'll work on branded cassocks. Thank you. Uh, to be fair, we just said polo. So it could have been like the sport. Yeah, we could have gotten you a horse and a mallet, mm-hmm. but you missed your chance. Sorry. Yes. All right. Uh, but, but if anyone would find a creative use for a horse and a mallet, I believe it would be you, Father. Um, anyway, second no, no. reading. <laughs> the second reading comes from when we have Father on, it's hard to like dare him like we do on other times on the podcast to do things. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, maybe it's easier, but like sometimes I just throw out little things on there knowing that he's going to be the one who emails us. <laughs> and it's like, yes, I'll do this or no, I won't. Or here's the here's the link. I did it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, second reading comes from one John chapter two, uh, John's reassuring believers that if anyone sins, they have an advocate in the father or with the father in Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So Jesus will advocate for them. He emphasizes the importance of keeping God's commandments as a sign of love for him. And that those who keep his word and abide by him, um, will know that. And, uh, exemplifying, uh, that it just shows the closeness of the relationship between obedience and love of God. If we are obedient, we follow the commandments. If we are, we sin less then our, the love of God shines in us even more. It, it lets your Lord, let your face shine on us. Speaking of that responsorial Psalm, is that a banger? Is it meh? Where's that? What's the categorization? Uh, I, I don't know if I've ever heard it before in my life. Okay. I don't know. Lord, let your face shine on us. I don't know. I'd, I'd have to go meh. I mean, yeah. it's one you can like remember and say. It's not a mumbler. Right. But we'll, have to, we'll but go with mid. Mid. It's mid. Kids, will, the kid, that's what the kids are saying yeah. these days. Um, it's not hungry. That was, a, that was, a, or it doesn't eat. No, it's not that hungry. My daughter doesn't like when I say that. It doesn't eat. If something's really good, it eats. That's what I've learned here recently. But do people say it doesn't eat? Yeah. It doesn't eat. Have you heard that at your cross country practices, Father? I have actually. That has not made its way down to southeastern Indiana. Ask ask about it. Maybe it has. Uh, I will bring this up today. We have a cross country. Meet. We have a track meet today. I will bring it yeah. up at the track meet. I'll be like that. That's track season. That's uh, track season is going well. We had our first meet outdoor meet last Friday, and uh, yeah, it's good. Cool. And the gospel. Uh, our gospel comes from Luke, chapter twenty four, thirty five to forty eight. The two disciples recounted what had taken place on the way and how Jesus was made known to them in the breaking of bread. While they were still speaking about this, he stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. But they were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. Then he said to them, Why are you troubled? And what why do you and why do questions arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and feet, that it is I my, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. Because a ghost does not have flesh, and but thank you for touching me, Scott. The ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you can see I have. And as he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they were still incredulous for joy and were amazed, he asked them, have you anything to eat here to eat, to eat? See, eat. Mm-hmm. They gave him a piece of baked fish. He took it and ate it in front of them. He said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything was written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that Christ would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnessed here because of these things. Well, you did a pretty good job there. Whale, thanks, because I have whales on my shirt. Mm-hmm. Is that what you did there? You're welcome. You've been holding on to that one since I walked in? Uh, no, halfway through the gospel, though. Okay, good. Ever since I touched your shoulder. <laughs> uh, Father Meyer, did Jeff get anything wrong? I would agree that he did 
a whale of a good job. And that was just fantastic. Good job right. on reading God's word. And I know that it was very awkward when you were reading the gospel because Scott touched you. And if I was reading the gospel at Sunday mass and one of my servers reached out and put his hand on my shoulder, I would you probably feel do, affirmed. I would, I would not like it. So thank you. <laughs> I would not like it. <laughs> Servers, if you're listening, that's your challenge this week. Is somebody go put a hand on Father's shoulder during the gospel? <laughs> Just in case he needs a little reassurance that he's doing a great job. <laughs> Just what a thought. Just I think like every virtues, like every virtues rule and everything else would I have, I have alarms going off all over the place. I'm going deep with virtues there. Uh, yeah, perhaps a side hug instead. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Or a head pat where culturally appropriate. Yes. Okay. Uh, very good. Father, sorry for that. Um, <laughs> everything that I just caused. What What are you preaching on this weekend? Oh my gosh. Thank you so for much for asking, Scott. I think I am I think I might preach on this weekend. The first opening lines of that gospel passage are making reference to a very famous gospel passage, which people all know, the road to Emmaus. So it's speaking about the two apostles who, after encountering Jesus in the breaking of the bread, now go back to the upper room where Jesus then makes himself manifest to the apostles in the upper room. I'm also going to make reference to in the gospel passage where it talks about how Jesus then went through scripture and explained himself. And you see... Uh, I've been heavily promoting this devotion called the 14 stations of the Eucharist. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. heard about this yet, but the 14 stations of the Eucharist is a biblical walk through the entirety of, of, of sacred scripture uh, and looks at all these images in the Old Testament, which reveal Jesus. Their typologies, their foreshadowings, symbols. So the sacrifice of Abel, the fact that God would only accept a lamb. God doesn't like vegetables, uh, which is what Cain offered. He likes meat. Um, <laughs> second would be the sacrifice of Abraham, of his son Isaac, which most people look at that as being a father offering his son, but let's remember that he doesn't. It's a replacement sacrifice because Abraham does offer. What does he offer? He offers a lamb. So we have two lambs there. Uh, next, we have Melchizedek, who offers a sacrifice of bread and wine. And he's a priest, not from the tribe of Levi. And then we have, of course, the Passover lamb. Um, the third reference to lambs, uh, which set the people free. We then have the temple being established. And we have the continual sacrifice of lambs. All of this being fulfilled in John the Baptist, who points to Jesus and clearly says, you are the lamb of God. Behold the lamb of God. At mass, because Jesus is the lamb of God, he gives us the Eucharist uh, very beautifully. In two consecrations, this is a, this is a part of the mass that most Catholics don't understand. We say that the mass is the representation of Calvary. It is a sacrifice because Jesus's body is consecrated, and then we make a separate consecration of his blood, which means that when you separate body and blood, you have death. Mm. But then the reason why it is not just his death, but the whole passion, death, and resurrection, is that the priest then takes the host during the unused day when we're calling out lamb of god making reference to abel abraham the passover lamb and the temple sacrifices which he fulfills all of he breaks the bread this making reference to emmaus and he then takes the host and puts it into the blood which is then resurrection so you have body and blood being brought back together the priest then turns to the people and says behold the lamb of god which is no, the no. which is the resurrected lamb so when we call the Mass the representation of Calvary, when we say that it is our Paschal sacrifice, when we say that it is our salvation, it is. And it has been my experience that people don't comprehend what the Mass is. So then we make the Mass about music, about fellowship, about whether the responsorial psalm is a banger or a mumbler. And we make it about a lot of other, other maybe we make it about the homily uh, instead of having the mass be what the mass is, which is our entrance into the ritual cultic ability to be present at the saving reality, which is Christ. So 
I think both that invitation that Jesus gives and that he opened the scriptures to them to open up the scriptures, beginning with Genesis, going through the Old Testament, but then also making that reference to these two individuals just recognize Jesus in the breaking of the bread. And at every mass, when the bread is broken, which is no longer bread, it's his body, is put into the chalice, which is you can actually, if you just like type in co-mingling into the <clears throat> into the interwebs, it'll come up and it'll actually say when the host is put into the chalice, which is the resurrection. Um, but that means if there's a resurrection, that means it was preceded by the death of Jesus, which is what the, the, the two separate consecrations. That's why the priest doesn't take the bread and the chalice at the same time and say, behold the body and blood of Jesus, because that would be resurrection. Um, so just, yeah, it's first communion weekend here, which is really interesting as well. Like, so we require children to go to mass, even though they can't receive communion. We force, force Catholic school kids to go to mass, even though they can't receive Holy Communion. And because the mass is more than just receiving communion, it's more than music, it's more than a great homily. The mass is, and always will be, it is the representation of Calvary. So just to like drive home that, that thought about what we're really doing here and why it's important. And then of course, the fruit of that is, yes, if it is, if it is the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, then yes, I want to be in one. I want to be one with him at that moment. I want to unite my body to his. I want to unite my heart to his. And so I have the opportunity to receive Holy Communion, which is the fruit of the sacrifice that is then given to us at that moment. So, and that's the route I'm going to take. I'd, I'd say that's a pretty good one. Yeah, that's good a solid. Yeah. That'd, be, that'd be good. Five stars. Oh, that was really good. Um, I mean, I'm I'm like at least, I'm pretty old. I don't know how old I am anymore. 30 i'm in my 30s and 37 didn't you just aren't you about to turn 37 actually how old how old are you scott i'm i'll be 37 on the 18th dude you need to call me we'll, we'll be just a decade apart from each other on that day nice decade buds because i'm 47 that's awesome uh and i just learned something new like i i i knew always knew that like the mass well always knew is an exaggeration but uh I've known that it is the passion, death, and resurrection, but I've never made the distinction that when the uh, the cup or the the two species was consecrated separately, that that was death. And specifically, it says after the supper or at the end of the meal, because it's anyways. Yeah, we can get in all the the mechanics and the specifics. Was yes making the distinction between the two consecrations and that it is and that's how they that's how you actually sacrifice the lamb in the old testament is it the way that it was sacrificed was actually the pouring out of its blood and there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood um i, I truly believe scott and this has been my experience as being like preaching across the nation and is that even the most devout catholics don't understand what the mass is and uh so that's pretty accurate yeah you're so you you shared we were talking to you last week and you shared those videos and i watched your your uh one of your videos on the 14 stations of the eucharist and it was very like enthralled it was just as intriguing as listening to you here like incredibly good but the way scott reacted is like the comment section on these videos which is really yeah. awesome because like comment sections are like that can be a pretty pretty dark place on stuff yep. But yours yep. is, it's a lot of this. It's a lot of that same reaction of like, I've spent my whole life in the church and this 15 minutes was the the most I've ever learned. And like, there's a lot of really cool stuff. Has this been your, your kind of standard Eucharistic preacher? Like what you've been preaching on as you've traveled and it, it's, yeah, it, it has been, it, it got to that point. It's evolved uh, into this. I've, yes. As I've been trying to, yeah. It, it, it got to that point where like, this is, this is what I'm preaching on because this is what people need because they don't know it. And I want them to know, I mean, and then just like, we can get like, why do we have mass intentions? There's no reason to pay a priest $10 to pray for a specific mass intention unless we believe the mass is like, we want that particular intention attached to the passion, death, and because it is the, it is literally, it is being at Calvary 
and so I want the, the main intention of that mass to be the repose of my uncle's soul or whatever it might be. But it, so when we begin to understand what the mass is, everything falls into line and everything makes a lot more sense. Even the priesthood, like the fact that I'm called a priest, there is no reason to have a priest unless you have sacrifice. That's what priests do is they offer sacrifice. But that's why, I mean, if you look at the past 30, 40 years, like priests have been looked at as like counselors and social workers and doers of social justice and all these other things, teachers, um, you know, school presidents, where no, I, I am a Catholic priest. I am here to offer the divine sacrifice. That's why I'm a priest. It's the Who new taught priest. you that? It's really sad, but I would have to actually say that like I've just kind of like kind of come to this on my own. Yeah, because I remember you shared with with me before, like even when you said yes to entering seminary, you weren't wildly theologically formed at that point. No, I clearly was not. I just wanted people to follow Jesus. In fact, I wasn't even Catholic. I mean, the, I, mean I didn't believe in the true presence of the Eucharist. I was pro-choice, and I never prayed the rosary when I was in seminary. I thank Archbishop Paul Asian all the time that he let me in the seminary. Um. Is that where a lot of the formation came about, or was it just a, a path of there was discovery? so what what happened is that I fell in love with Jesus in the Eucharist. I found out that Jesus the Jesus that I love was present in the tabernacle. And then I was just like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. No one knows that Jesus is present in the tabernacle. And so I spent, I mean, I it, in, in self-reflection, I would have to say like I've I spent the last uh 28 years of my life trying to get people to believe that Jesus was present in the tabernacle. And the last year of my life, I've realized, once again, with you, Scott, I had like this idea. I knew that the mass, but I had no idea like really that it was and how it was the representation of Calvary. And once I understood that, like mm -hmm. if I had to do it all over again, I would have spent the last 28 years helping people to understand what the mass is. Because if you understand the masses, the representation of Calvary, then the blessed sacrament, then Jesus being present in the blessed sacrament is just a given. Like mm. it's, and it's, it, I'm not saying it's not amazing. Like I've opened three perpetual adoration chapels and I try, I, mean, I, I love Eucharistic adoration devotion, but, but if you, it, like that emphasis no, still needs to be there. But if you understand the mass for being what the mass really is, then like everything falls into place. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, you're pretty great. Good job. I'm not. God is really you are. Great. No, you really are. But because you care, because you do. That's the difference is you said you just said something that struck me that like, and I know it about you, but you spent the last 28 years trying to like, you just want everyone to know. And like, because you truly believe like if they know, how can they, how can you not love Jesus? How can you not be drawn there to the tabernacle, to the mass if you know that? that he's present, his love is present there. And that's the difference is you, you, you know that. And then you've spent the last, I know for a fact, you've spent almost every waking moment of the last 28 years trying to drive people to that. And like, thank you for that. Absolutely. I remember back in the day when the Super Bowl was in Indianapolis, they did, uh, they like trained people on how to give tours of St. John's, which is like right downtown in Indianapolis. And Scott, Scott Noose, I believe this is who it was. Um, I was going on one of the tours, just kind of like checking everything out. And he was talking about like all the beautiful paintings and the windows and things like that. And then we got to the front of the the church. And he goes, and this is my favorite part of this tour that I get to to show. And he like pointed at the tabernacle. And he goes, that gold box right there, inside there is Jesus. And like being able to like give this tour at downtown Minneapolis of like beautiful paintings and things like that. And like the reality is like, the most beautiful thing that we can witness as, as part of our faith is inside that box that we keep the door that the door is locked on. And like inside that box holds Jesus Christ. And yeah, I think that's worth 28 years of telling mm -hmm. people about. Yeah. Done a good yeah. job. And I would, and I can, I just add, so I added that like, so I would, I would, it, where I'm at now and where the Lord has led me, I would say, I would say those exact same words. And I would say, and this marble slab here is called an altar. And altars exist for sacrifice. And we believe that every single mass through the words of consecration, a host, a piece of bread becomes Jesus's body. 
and separately a chalice becomes his blood. And when you separate body from blood, you have death. And we believe that the death of Jesus from 2000 years ago miraculously becomes present. Like the death of Jesus on Calvary is present here. And then in this mass, that priest is ultimately going through the breaking of the bread, is going to mingle the bread into the chalice, and we have the resurrection. And our, our, whole, our whole salvation takes place right here. And we have the ability to unite ourselves to that through communion, through prayer. And that's why this church building exists, is for people to gather to be present at their salvation. And, and I mean this, Scott, I wouldn't have said that at the Super Bowl. I would have said this with Jesus lives in that gold box and it's stinking awesome, which it is stinking awesome. But it's also, mm -hmm. it is the, you know, and I, yeah, it's, and you, you know, we all have a youth ministry background. When I think about all of the liturgical talks and all of the things that we do to try to make young people understand what the mass is and to be a part of the mass and be engaged in the mass and to make the mass relatable to them. I'm just like, I had such an opportunity to, to help young people and I didn't have what I could have had to help them. Yeah. But like, but also like that journey is, I mean, that's like a journey. Like you, yeah. I, can yeah. you really start with that as the sacrifice all the time? Or do we have to be drawn in by the beauty and then. I mean, like, yeah, it's, it's clearly, this is the journey that God has had me on, but I, yeah. I look back and like, gosh, I think I, anyways, yeah. Yeah, I can't go back. It's like talking to my athletes after they run a terrible race. You can't go back. All you can do is move forward. But yeah. But, he, but even today, like if you were to to introduce somebody brand new that's never experienced what we consider body, blood, soul, and divinity, would you start there? Um, I actually think I would. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But... So, okay. What else yeah. we got? Anything? As a part of this, I want like you. I've heard like stations. I like that. Like station seems to be something you kind of like revert back to. In I've heard you do multiple versions of the stations of fill in the blank. Is that just because like is that out of like that's how your brain works, or that out of like you've done it before and it works and people get it. And so you've continued to kind of like build the, these teachings around that or where does that? Yeah. Come so, so the stations of the Eucharist, I, 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 the, the idea came from the Franciscan sisters, the poor Claire sisters in Hansville, Alabama. Like that's where the idea came from. Oh, okay. They, they had a version of the stations of the Eucharist. Uh, and I used that and, got rid of some and added others and ultimately developed what I have. But um, the idea came from that. But I, I do think that, I don't know, I love the idea of being on a journey. My, my mom took me to the Stations of the Cross every Lent when I was a kid, like every Friday we went. So it was, it was, it's just like rooted all to like just kind of in my heart as well. Um, but yeah, I love the Stations of the Cross at World Youth Day. So I, I do like the stations in general. So yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I think it's cool. It It connects. And it just, and it makes yeah. sense that people, especially if you get people who have been exposed to the stations of the cross, like it clicks and, and they, they, they know, get it. they yeah. know that cadence, they know how that works, which makes it easier yeah. to kind of get into that there. So yeah. good job. Um, all right. Dumber questions. Uh, do you have any, so I've been asking this, you've heard it. Do you have any like go-to routines or superstitions or like mass prep things that you do, you're an athlete and like you, you, you coach and like, you know, you hear stories about like a baseball player who always puts his left sock on, right? Like you have any of those types of like things that you do that are particular to you before you uh, get ready for mass or as you're prepping for mass or you can't call it superstitions. Routine. Yeah, I think we should... said routines. Yeah. Huh? Routines. Yeah. It'd be devotions. Prayerful maybe, devotions say. and actions. Yeah. It'd be great. Uh, I would say that at earlier times in my priesthood, I have had different like routines and habits. Like I used to always like, it was a big thing for me to like, yeah, like shower, shave, get like cleaned up before on Saturday evening before mass. But that isn't a big thing for me anymore. I used to 
love when I was a newly ordained priest, I would go for a walk. I would always walk, go for a walk around the park in, in, uh, uh, in Greenwood. And I would preach my homily out loud to myself and to God. And, uh, I don't do that anymore. Uh, I would say the majority of it now is me coming in and we have a routine that we have with the, with the servers. So I put on my vestments and then we, they, they're called altar server promises. And so they, they make like these eight promises and then we say this common prayer together and then we go. So I would say like, that would be, yeah, that's my pre game sacristy devotion and routine. Like kind of get hype thing. You do that it's and then you all slap each other in the face and then you go out and yeah. Exactly. What are the eight promises? I will prayerfully serve the Lord. I'll be attentive in all things. I will walk, act, and serve with reverence. I will stand the track and make reverent pauses. I will open my mouth and recite the prayers and the responses of the mass. I will hang up my alb or cassock with dignity. And then we make the sign of the cross and it's a prayer, dear Lord Jesus. I feel like that. For oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I don't need to finish the prayer. I, I was just going to say, I feel like uh, that used to be seven promises and then people weren't hanging their albs right. And oh, then there's, you... been, there's been <laughs> other ones that there, 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 there's been ones that have been added and have been taken out over the years. Uh, yes. I'll yes. wear appropriate shoes. And, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's pretty cool. Uh, and you obviously, your altar boys, like they, they're a loyal group. And yeah. B O Y Z. It works. Yeah. Yes. Boys. Um, all right. Uh, can you tell me what a manipole is? I can tell you what a manipole is. A manipole is a vestment, which is no longer listed in the general instruction of the Roman Missal as a appropriate vestiture for a priest. A uh, manipole was a liturgical vestment that was worn attached to the priest's sleeve um, it was supposed to be that the priest would be so overwhelmed. It symbolically was the priest was so overwhelmed by the sacrifice, Jesus's death taking place that he would weep during the mass. And so he would need a handkerchief. So practically it just came from the fact of the priest needed a handkerchief during like the sweat, mass. Right? Yeah. Yeah. For either sweat or for mucus coming out of, you know, so uh, that's, you know, where the practicality of it came out of. But um, when one celebrates the TLM, the Latin mass, the extraordinary form of the mass, they would still use a manifold. I've seen, I mean, I've seen them before. It's like, it hangs on like their left arm and now, but now they're like very ornate. They often match the vestments. Yes. Yes. For the yeah. mass. And okay. Yeah. 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 But it's no longer mentioned in the general instruction or missiles or in, in any of the, post conciliar documents about what to be what vestments the priest is to wear or what is to be laid out or prepared for the mass it's no longer mentioned got it so um i also was thinking in here i was joking about you getting a polo horse earlier but i think maybe you need a lamb like if i've ever known anyone who needs a lamb i think it might be you and so do you do you not know what i have do you have a lamb i have a taxidermied lamb that i i can send you pictures of it a taxidermied uh, one yeah i use it as like a prop and stuff <laughs> but it like, used to be an actual lamb oh yeah yeah <laughs> like it's 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 straight up real his and his name is pascal and uh and uh oh yeah he's uh he's been in fact, if you go back and watch one of those videos about the 14 stations of the Eucharist, the one that's the tour, he he's yeah, he he played the role of the sacrifice of Abel in the museum version of the 14 Wait, stations the of the cross. Yeah. Where does he stay the rest of the time? <laughs> he's down by I have a relic chapel. I have like I collect relics, so I have and he's it's a down, relic in the land. He's He's down there because I use anyways, I bring the relics out for all the whenever it's their feast day, they they show I have the relic at the mass. And so sometimes I, I use Pascal for like a school homily prop or Father Hollow is not a big fan of Pascal. <laughs> I can't imagine. I can't but, imagine. <laughs> but does he help you like carry him around? No, not at all. He won't touch him. <laughs> <laughs> 
But yeah, I have a, uh, I have a uh, layer, Jeff. I'll, I'll okay, send never mind. I did. Uh, you, you can put the pictures in the show notes. I think. <laughs> yeah, we'll do that. Um, Wait, how did you? Where'd you get this from? Like, so it's really interesting. I was doing about, this thing. Tell me about the time the, when you emailed somebody and said, "I need this done." Yeah. So during the Jubilee year for Mercy in 2007, I've always wanted a, a, a tax return lamb because if you understand that the mass is a sacrifice, then it, then, I, then Jesus is the sacrificial lamb, and we have to understand that. He, like, he, anyways, it's one of the most powerful biblical pro, biblical prophecies and fulfillments is is the Paschal lamb, and so I've always wanted the Paschal lamb. And um, I, in Jubilee year 2017, the Jubilee year for mercy, I went around and I tried to bless every house in my parish boundaries. And within two days, I, I went to this one house and um, they were farmers. And I was asking them just about like what was happening in their life on the farm. And they were like, uh, well, tomorrow we're going to be lambing. And I was like, oh, I don't know. What, what does it mean to be a lamb? They're like, that's when we take the lambs and go and get slaughtered. And then so I'm just like, you have lambs? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's amazing. I was like, what do you do with them? And they're like, well, we we have them all slaughtered so that we can sell the meat at the market. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's fantastic. The next day, I'm blessing someone's house. And I'm like, uh, so what do you do professionally? And he's like, well, I pour concrete. He said, but I have a, I have a side job. And I was like, oh, what do you do? And he's like, uh, I'm a taxidermy artist. And I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah. And he opens this door. And he, I walk to his room. And there's this like dead animals everywhere. And I'm like, whoa, this is fascinating. And so while I'm looking at all these dead animals that he has like on display, which you can like show up to like, you know, get ideas of how you can mount your deer or whatever. I'm just like, have you ever taxed me to lamb? And he said, no. And I was like, would you like to? Like a whole said, lamb? Yeah. I was like, I saw a guy yesterday. Anyways, so long story short. Um, yeah. So I was like one plus one equals two. And I now have Pascal. He's so cute. Oh can I just tell God. you this funny story? So like I used him as a prop. At that, wasn't time. that wasn't yeah. it. That wasn't it because I used him as a, pretty funny here for a minute. I used him. I used him as a prop at mass. This is like early on, and um, the people at the school mass knew who the taxidermy artist was because his his wife was the cafeteria manager, and I uh, I had him sitting like on a table next to the ambo because I was talking about the Pascal lamb, and um, and I looked at the first and second graders in kindergarten and first graders in the front rows. I was like, boys and girls, this is Pascal the lamb. And you, you know, Miss Mary who works in the cafeteria? Well, her husband, she taught him how to sit real still. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, if you're really good during mass today, boys and girls, your teachers might let you come up after mass and, and pet Pascal, okay? So after mass, this is no joke, like after mass, like a little kid comes up to me and he's like, I saw, I saw Pascal blink during the mass. I'm just like, this is awesome. And, uh, and then another kid, like he's petting him. He's like, he jumps back. He, goes, he just moved. I just felt it. And all the other kids like, no, no, it was awesome. I, just, I love little kids. They're so hilarious. But yeah, anyway, so Pascal lamb, I will send you pictures. That is wild. I never know when I'm at like, Yeah. I don't even know. I should expect it now when I ask you a question. All right. You ready to wrap it up? Yep. I wanted to share. We got a really nice note from a listener a couple weeks ago. Yeah. And I think it's important to share these, even though like my my humility. Sometimes I don't want to say it, but and I think people just think we make it up. <laughs> mm. Emailing each other about how great it is. But um, I don't do you remember her name? Nope. I don't either. You'll know who you are. Uh she she wrote us some stuff about uh, listening to the po our Easter podcast, but then she finished with, finally, I just want to thank you both for this podcast. For the last year and a half, my sister and I live oceans apart, but are continually brought together by your podcast, humor, and spiritual community. As a mom, this is exactly what I need to look forward to every week. You're a blessing to this world. Thank you for sharing your talent with the world. Maggie. So, Maggie. Yeah. It was a really nice message. Uh, she did also point out, Father, that Scott and I are funnier without the guest priest there. She did say that also in her email. I, not my words, hers, but either way. Uh, thank you, Maggie. That was very kind to hear. And uh, we do, we really love doing this. And it's always nice to get some feedback. So, yeah. But how many? Yeah, uh, thanks, Maggie. I appreciate lambs that. Lambs do you have? Yeah, Maggie, uh, if you could send us pictures of your taxidermy lamb, we'd appreciate it. Yeah. And Maggie, I would also like to say that um, at Easter time, there's only one beer that I drink, and it's called Whirling. Yes. Get it? <laughs> that did come from the easter special yeah, <laughs> you, yeah. all right father meyer thank you for joining us as always okay. god bless peace Bye.